Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I am so glad that you're here. Today we have nine questions, a lot about trauma, a lot about being um, a therapist and whether or not you hug patients, why would you, why wouldn't you, all sorts of questions, even things about you know depression and sleepiness. Let's get right into it. Question number one says, hey Katie, what are the ripple effects of trauma and PTSD being untreated for years and us being forced to quote unquote function. Are there any differences regarding the effects this can have on a child or a teen versus a young adult versus an adult? Are there both psychological and physical consequences? I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, your expertise with us every week. Of course, happy to help. Now, when it comes to trauma, a great study, now there'll be some caveats, but just hear me out. A great study that shows the uh, the long-term effects of trauma, especially childhood, it's called the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That's what ACEs stands for, A-C-E. That shows you the physical effects of having trauma in childhood and what it can mean for our physical as well as really emotional health throughout our lives. And a lot of people, you know, get frustrated with the ACEs study because they're like, well, are those the only traumas that count? No, of course not. That is just a, a way for them to kind of easily rank and rate and then also track uh, physical manifestations, like things like high blood pressure or diabetes, heart disease. They track those kinds of things and its connection to trauma. And we find essentially that the higher level of ACEs, meaning that more adverse childhood experiences we have, the kind of worse physical outcome in our physical health we have as we get older, okay? And the reason I bring that up is because even though all of those traumas, it doesn't doesn't cover all the traumas that we can sustain, but it shows us a correlation between mental health and physical health, which, I mean, I think you and I would both say, like, of course, there's a correlation because it's connected, hello. This old way of thinking where we believe that our physical health is different than our mental health that's just simply not true. And any person who still believes that is frankly misinformed and maybe choosing to be ignorant because think of our brain as like the hard drive of our bodies, right? And I don't know about you, but when I feel anxious, my body has a response, right? My anxiety causes me to overheat and sweat. It causes me to fidget. It causes my heart rate to increase and my my breath to shorten. That's a simple way of showing the direct correlation between mental health and physical health right there, right? And trauma is even a more intensive version of that. So that's kind of the foundation from which I want to answer this question because the ripple effects of trauma being untreated is that if we have an adverse childhood experience, we could have more intensive physical issues later on. Things, like I said, like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart disease. There's a a huge list. You can look up the ACEs study. It was done by, I don't know if it was the NIMH or the center, if it was CDC, but it was one of those like big organizations and in conjunction with with the pharmaceutical company. I don't know if it was Johnson & Johnson or if it was all pharmaceutical companies. But anyway, they did it a lot. Oh, it was Kaiser Permanente. That's who it was. Anyway. You can look up that study and you can read all about it. I talk about it in my book, Traumatized. Um, but that in and of itself shows that it being untreated or us having a trauma in childhood is going to lead to those kinds of issues. Now, I believe also as an example of another thing, like I had a patient many years ago, and this is indicative of not just this patient, but a lot of patients, we can have things like adrenal fatigue. And you think of the ways, like, you know how they talk about uh, like Britney Spears or other celebrities having, going through like exhaustion. I believe a lot of my trauma patients or PTSD, complex PTSD patients go through something similar because essentially our bodies, if we're hypervigilant for a long period of time, it exhausts not only our adrenal glands or things that would ready us to take action, right? We probably have a super enlarged amygdala but all of that can be really, really taxing and exhausting on our body overall. And I find a lot of my patients with complex PTSD struggle to sleep, so there's insomnia. And we know if we don't sleep properly, that can lead where they're finding more connections with Alzheimer's and other types of issues. So all in all, 
our mental health is going to affect our physical health and they're the ripple effects are almost endless it depends on the person right it depends on your body and how it affects you and then those effects in turn can cause physical issues right if we're not sleeping that's one thing if we feel hyper vigilant all the time that's another if both those things are happening that's its own thing right so overall those are some of the ripple effects not to mention so that's physical manifestations you can read the aces study you can read my book traumatized get it at your local library there's audiobooks all that stuff to hear about all of the ways that our trauma can affect us in physical health. <clears throat> then we get into emotional health and relationships. Now, my patients who have untreated trauma for much of their life tend to struggle in relationships, whether it be that they prefer to not have any. I have a ton of patients who kind of in the attachment-based stuff go more avoidant. They're like, get out of here. Feels too unsafe to have someone know me or get close to me please get away. But there are others who kind of cling to other people thinking that that will help them feel less afraid or less at risk, less vulnerable. And so we can be really clingy in relationships and, you know, also be super reactive, right? If we're hypervigilant, if we think everything's kind of a, a threat to us, we can be on edge and we can, you know, react to people really quickly without thinking about it because frankly, we don't have the resilience to, to, take a beat and decide how we want to respond. Does that make sense? So overall, there are a shit ton of ripple effects to trauma and it being untreated. And us being forced to quote unquote function doesn't necessarily play into it. I think being forced to function could mean that we have to be out into the world. And so our hypervigilance might be a little bit more intense or something like that. But overall, in general, just the fact that we sustained a trauma and then had to continue living our life, right? The fact that it didn't get treated can manifest itself in all the ways that I just mentioned. And the differences regarding it versus a child, teen, young, adult, and adult, I don't know all of the research, but what I do know is that when things happen in our childhood, it has a greater impact on us. Not necessarily teen, I'm talking children. Um, I would argue it'd probably be like, I don't know, five or 10 years old or younger. That can affect more intensively things like our attachment, um, the way that we interact with other people. It, it's it's almost like while we're trying to develop a safe foundation in our life, someone takes that away from us. And so it affects us very differently than it, if it happens when we're a teen or a young adult or adult. <clears throat> I would argue that the older we get, the less impact the trauma has on things like you know, attachment-based work or um, kind of like dysfunction in our relationships going forward. It doesn't mean it can't affect it. But when we're a child, again, we're putting together this blueprint for what life's going to look like. And if the blueprint is trauma-based, then we're going to go out into the world with a really dysfunctional or faulty blueprint. And we're going to probably find people who are also very similarly uh, abusive or harmful in some way or dismissive, right? Because that's what we have. Now, if we let's say had a healthy childhood, somehow ended up in some kind of situation we were traumatized as an adult, that doesn't necessarily have that same effect. It could, but it doesn't always have that same effect. It's, it's much more impactful when things happen to us when we're children because we're still developing and growing and learning about our world. And we don't really have other experiences or more resilience to pull from, right? Our resources are pretty limited. And so that can be much more severe, almost in the same way that I would say um, when it comes to mental illnesses, there's a ton of research to show that the sooner we have symptoms of something, the more severe or or difficult to treat the outcome is. And what I mean by that is like if I have a patient who is experiencing schizophrenic symptoms when they're younger, like really early onset, let's say they're like eight years old or 10 years old, the outcome is not going to be, it tends to not be as good or to get full resolution of symptoms as it would be if someone had late onset and they didn't have symptoms of schizophrenia until they're like 45, right? And so things like that in general, the longer we deal with something, the younger we are when it happens, like that's, it has a deeper impact on our life going forward, simply because we're dealing with it for less amount of time and our brain is still developing when we're younger. Therefore, we're like more impressionable and it can affect us in much deeper ways. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, there was an add-on to this, and it said, is bullying always trauma? It can be if we if we feel 
<clears throat> oh, let me finish our question. It says, in school, most people would only talk to me when they wanted to copy my, an answer on a test. They indirectly called me a nerd and didn't want to be around me because of my quote unquote reputation as a nerd. I changed schools but when I recently saw someone from that time. It triggered terrible thoughts in my head about me being worthless. I, however, don't have PTSD. Now, a couple things to unpack here. Bullying can definitely be trauma when it threatens, like we feel threatened our safety and security, right? We worry about our um, our ability or someone else's ability to stay safe in a situation, right? Trauma really means that we fear for the life or safety of us or someone close to us. So what you dealt with, I don't, it could have been considered emotional abuse. It doesn't sound like they said it to you, but indirectly, I'm not sure. Um, but you definitely felt isolated. So trauma hap can happen to any of us. We can become traumatized, right? If we fear for our safety or life or that of someone else that we know, right? However, not all trauma turns into PTSD. Some of us are traumatized and we have enough skills and resilience to kind of work our way through it. And so it never manifests itself as PTSD. That's just the nature of life. Some of us are better able to weather those storms. And so in your case, even if that was traumatizing to you, which only you would know, no one out there should judge that and decide. You would know if you feared for your life or safety or the life and safety of someone else, you felt overwhelmed by it, unable to manage it or process it, maybe even blips of like dissociation or don't remember things for this time period. All of that could have affected you. You'd have to assess that for yourself. But the fact that you don't have PTSD just means that even if it was trauma back then, you were able to manage it. You were able to process it. You had enough resilience to deal. Um, so that's kind of how that works. But bullying, can it's not always trauma, but it definitely can be. Just like anything, um, actions in and of themselves aren't necessarily traumatizing. The trauma occurs because of our ability to process it and manage it in the moment. Okay? Now, another person said, as an add-on, is grief considered trauma? And what effects can complicated grief have on someone if left unresolved? Grief can be, just like bullying, can be considered a trauma. It's not always a trauma. Again, it's about our ability to weather the storm. It's about our ability to process what happened. Um, grief can be overwhelming. Uh, trust me, I've grieved a lot. I've lost a lot of people in my life, unfortunately. And the weight of it is overwhelming. And I would argue even in my from my standpoint, the grief was more, it's more than I can process in the moment, but I don't feel traumatized by it. Uh, grief is, it's different depending on the person, right? Complicated grief can mean that the relationship itself was more, there was distress in it. It wasn't very healthy. Maybe we had a strained relationship. Maybe the way that they passed away, you know, they wanted us to be there. We couldn't get there, right? There can be all sorts of reasons that we can struggle with complicated grief. I have an entire video about it if you want to learn more. However, um, it's too much, the grief was too much for me to process, but I don't believe I was traumatized because I didn't fear for my life or safety, right? Or or their life or safety, right? The, the grief that I experienced was over time and like my grandparents passing away, there was nothing traumatic about the way that they died for me. Again, every person is different. It can definitely be traumatizing if you lose someone abruptly. Um, I had a, a friend of mine whose parent fell ill and like, they died in like three weeks later. It was really like just crazy how fast it progressed. Um, and that can be really overwhelming and that can be traumatizing. Now, when grief is not processed and it isn't uh, worked through, because I feel like I use that word process a lot. And it really means that when we process through something, it means that we allow ourselves to experience the feelings that come up. We identify them. We acknowledge them. We let ourselves talk about it. We vent about it. We express the experience that we're having to people in our lives. That could be a therapist, that could be friends, that could be family, it could be all of the above. We do that until it doesn't feel emotionally charged anymore. Meaning that when I think about it and when it comes up or when something happens, I'm not triggered. I don't feel overwhelmed. I'm like, oh yeah, that happened. It's just a thing that happened. It doesn't mean I can't get sad every so often about it, but it means that for the most part, I'm not like overcome. Like if somebody asked me about my grandma when she first passed away, I would just cry. But now if someone asked me, I would say, yeah, she passed away. It was really sad. And, and I'm glad I got to see her before, you know, she passed away like a week after I left and blah, blah, blah. And I can talk about it and I don't burst into tears. And that's because I've processed it. I hope that kind of helps clear that up. But the thing about um, grief is that if it goes untreated for 
a long period of time. We never try to work through it. We keep stuffing it down. Just like anything else in our life that can turn into a mental illness, meaning grief can be the kind of caveat, not the caveat, but like the the thing that creates like the, the, the beginning of depression or anxiety or really any mental illness, but depression and anxiety are the most common because the symptoms won't resolve because we're not moving through them and they can kind of grow. Like we all know, if we start to feel some symptoms of anxiety or depression and we ignore it instead of reaching out to our therapist or psychiatrist or whatever, doing our tools, it'll get worse, right? You can't just ignore it or have it be untreated. Um, and so, yeah, so that can definitely happen if we do not resolve our trauma or our grief, sorry. Another add-on says, is it possible to completely recover from trauma due to childhood sexual abuse or um, do to body memories, flashbacks, nightmares, and intrusive, or do those things, sorry, it was a typo and I misread it, um, flashbacks, nightmares, and intrusive thoughts haunt people after they're done with trauma work and therapy. Will I ever feel complete again? For context, I've been in therapy for trauma due to childhood sexual abuse for the past eight months, and my physical symptoms and emotional flooding has only gotten worse. I was living in a dissociative state for almost 15 years and even able to function well in academics and at work, but never in personal relationships or connecting with humans. I feel wounded and shattered and act like a scared little girl at times, especially when I'm triggered, and as a rational or empowered adult at other times. I have developed a fear of physical intimacy and get startled even when females touch me. I feel anxious to think that I might have to live this way forever. Okay, no, you will not um, have to deal with this forever. You can completely recover. Now, the thing about recovering when it comes to mental illness, just like it does with physical illness, we all have our weakness, right? I've explained this before that growing up, I would always, not always, but like if I got sick, it most likely would go into my throat and I'd get strep throat. That's just how my body dealt with it. I don't know why. It's annoying, but that happened. And that's kind of like my weakness, almost like Sean always gets bronchitis, right? If he's going to get a cold, it's going to be a chest cold. The same goes for our mental health. If I tend to be more of a depressed person, I've struggled with depression off and on, then when I get maxed out or stressed out or something happens in my life, I'm going to have a tendency to go to those depress depressive types of, types of symptoms and thoughts. Sorry, I stuttered there for a second. Um, because that's kind of my, my weakness. Now, that's just life and that's us managing and that's just being human. But the thing that keeps us out of that and doesn't keep us held in our depression or continuing for me to get strep throat, right, is I have tools and resources and things I know that work for me and I'm going to use them. So in the example of depression, if I feel my depression coming on, I know to call my psychiatrist, I increase sessions with my therapist or call and make an appointment in general. And I make sure that I get outside and get sun on my face every day because that like changes my life, right? I'm going to have some of my tools. Maybe that means I start journaling again, or I, I keep, I call friends more often and get more connected, right? There's going to be tools and resources that I use to pull myself out. And that's because I know better because I've been here before. So when it comes to you recovering, I want you to know that trauma work is hard and it does get worse before it gets better because we've been stuffing it down for so long. It's like we've opened it up finally and it's like, oh, all the things at once and it can feel really overwhelming. But as we start to piece and parse through it, make our way, start processing all that comes up for us, it does start to calm down. I know it sucks that it gets worse before it gets better, but it's because we open up those wounds and our new coping skills are still new and we're not really good at using them and we forget and we're still doing old behaviors, right? It just takes some time to learn a new way of coping. So it will go down and get better. Um, however, when anything, let's say stressful things happen in your life, you're not sleeping well, something like you'll say you lose your job or something, just life gets chaotic because it's life. You will find those old little like trauma kind of situations and experiences and things like flashbacks come back maybe a little bit, but you know better. You know where they come from and you have tools to manage them. So as they kind of like start to make their way back, you're like, ah, da, 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 and you use your tools and it goes away. So unlike how it feels now where you're like, I can't do anything to make it go away and this is terrible, that does not last forever. But we will have this like propensity for those types of symptoms. And so it's good to get to know them because then we can treat them more quickly with the tools and resources that we know help us. So yes, it will go away. The nightmares and flashbacks and truth of thoughts will 
go down to the point where if they do pop back, you're like, oh, and then you do your behaviors that are helpful. You do your coping skills and you feel better. That's how that really works. And that's because you're living in a dissociative state for so long. You haven't been even able to, to disconnect or to connect because you've been disconnected for so long. So this reconnection is why the symptoms are worse now. It's very normal. I know it sucks. I'm so sorry. But we will get you out of that like hypervigilant state with all these trauma symptoms flooding back and get you to a place where you can live and thrive, not just survive. Okay. Now there's another add-on. It says, I experienced childhood trauma as an adult. Um, oh, I experienced childhood trauma and as an adult had a run of small things happen. I experienced domestic violence in my one and only relationship. I had an extremely toxic work workplace and experienced sexual harassment. And I was reversed into, into by a car and pinned between it and a big steel post. I thought I was going to be killed. Throughout this time, I was a single mom trying to keep my life in check so I could give my daughter the best possible care, love, and support. I became so ill with an autoimmune condition, which can happen, unfortunately, as a result of trauma, and struggled with untreated anorexia, which resulted in amenorrhea and heart issues. Trauma was absolutely connected to my eating disorder, but could an autoimmune disease be related to all this? I feel like I could have prevented it from happening. Trauma, now, I don't have research on this, so this is my opinion. And I encourage all of you to do your own research to make sure that what I'm saying is correct. But I've seen this time and time again in my own practice and now in our community over and over where when we have repeated trauma, so complex PTSD, meaning more than one traumatic experience in our life, when it goes untreated and, you know, we're having these things happen and we just feel like we're drowning in the symptoms, it is stressful on our body. Like I said with the ACEs study, we find that adverse childhood experiences can lead to health conditions. I believe repeated traumas can lead to autoimmune issues. Now I've had patients who had an autoimmune issue before being traumatized and it got exacerbated. Like one of my patients had Crohn's disease and it just got incredibly worse. I've had people in our community have, you know, fibromyalgia come out of nowhere. Hashimoto's, all sorts of autoimmune issues as a result of trauma. Now, again, I don't, I haven't done the research to find out if they have looked at that directly, but I think you could extrapolate from the ACEs study and say that, yes, this could lead to that, right? That kind of a situation could lead to an autoimmune response because autoimmune is really like our body fighting itself, right? It's overreacting. And I, not that, again, not a doctor, not a researcher, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that when our body feels like it's constantly under threat and so we're hypervigilant, so any small thing sets us off, that it's not already overreacting. And I don't mean overreacting as a judgment. I mean it as an honest thing. Like what's happening is not doesn't kind of warrant that intense of a response, but we're giving it anyways because we are already feeling on edge. So that kind of overreaction over and over and over and over, I don't think it's a big jump to say that, well, then I think our immune system could also be overreacting because it thinks everything's a threat, just like we do in our environment, right? So yes, I believe there's a, if, Hopefully they're doing research on this or there is research. If someone finds it, please link it in the comments. That would be incredibly helpful. Um, But I believe that we will see more and more correlations with long-term or complex trauma and autoimmune diseases. Now, again, you know, I haven't done my research, so feel free to do yours, but I do believe there is that correlation. And then it's my belief that if we treat the trauma and we feel less reactive in our environment, that our autoimmune symptoms will lessen. Now, I don't, think it would make it go away. Maybe, I mean, again, talk to a doctor who specializes in autoimmune um, diseases and disorders, but I would assume that at least those intense symptoms would kind of go down or subside as we become less reactive. Okay. Let's move on to question number two. It says, hey, Katie, I hope you're doing well. My question is, why do I feel sad when I'm tired? I have major depressive disorder. So let's say I'm having a busy day been running errands, meeting with people and stuff like that. At the end of the day, I feel physically tired. So I rest on the couch to watch my favorite TV show or listen to music, pleasant activities. And it's at this moment that I start feeling sad or it's more realizing that I'm sad. Remember that statement. We're going to get into this. 
I have no reason to be sad. I actually quite enjoyed the day and I'm glad I got things done. To make things worse, I start to dwell on that feeling and negate that it was a good day. Am I getting sad from being physically tired? Do the two go together? Or maybe I can't tell them apart. I'm confused and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well as any advice on what I can do. Thank you. Now, my initial knee-jerk reaction was when we're busy and we're doing things, we're distracted. That makes it harder to pay attention to how we feel. We're busy doing stuff. I have other things to focus on. I got my to-do list. I have uh, things at work or school or whatever I need to take care of. I don't have time to think about how bad I feel. But then, oh, things quiet. My day gets simpler. And guess what? I can all of a sudden recognize my depressive symptoms because I've been distracted all day. And unfortunately, that's why usually my depressed patients or even my anxious patients, any of my patients with mental health issues will report that it's worse at night. Why is it worse at night? Because I think it's a two-part. Number one, we're not distracted because there's nothing else going on. The world has kind of quieted. Number two, if we have been doing stuff all day long, we can be a little bit more exhausted and our resilience is a little lower. So the symptoms that we might've been able to manage during the day, we aren't able to keep up with at night. Those are two of the main reasons I think this happens. So you're not like, it's not uncommon. You're not weird for feeling this way. I think you're feeling sad in general, but then when you get tired, your resilience is a little lower and there's not as many distractions. And then you feel that that much more intensely. And so there's that. But then I don't want to forget in my last little piece about this is the fact that like feeling exhausted, like I think it uh, says experiencing lethargy in the symptoms of MDD, but feeling tired is kind of part of depression. And so when we stop moving and we're like, okay, then we might feel that. And we're like, oh, I'm so tired. And it's because our depression can give us that sensation. It can create that exhaustion. We can feel like doing anything in our day is just like, oh, it's too much, right? So many of my depressed patients will say, you know, I really wanted to like clean the house or I want to shower or make myself a meal. But the thought of doing it is just exhausting. Like I just don't have the energy. And so depression can rob us of our energy. So it could be a piece of that. But I think those other things are also why we're not experiencing them during the day and why we feel like we had a good day. You know, we were doing all this stuff. It felt good. We were distracted from our depressive thoughts and feelings. So those are my thoughts about it. Now, someone said, as an add-on, I know that people with BPD or borderline personality disorder experience feelings more intensely than others. However, Is it normal or common that quote unquote good feelings like euphoria, positive excitement, or happiness are also becoming too intense? For example, looking forward to a vacation or meeting a new person you really like. Sometimes I am so happy about things that um, that it's just too much to handle. It's too intense and I can't calm down. Yes. Um, In general, those of us with BPD feel everything intensely. Um, That's why we call it emotional burn victims. So any little emotion feels way more intense. And this isn't good emotions or bad emotions, although we do tend to, because we're hypervigilant usually when we have BPD, we do tend to um, take any threats to our potential like security in a relationship because we have a huge fear of abandonment. We take any of those possible slights or threats really personally. And that is, I would argue, the most intense reaction we're going to get, an emotional reaction. It all comes from that. That can be very hardcore. However, any other emotion, good or bad, if you want to like, you know, good or bad, like happy or unhappy, will be felt with more intensity. And I actually had a BPD patient for many years that I saw whose scariest or worst emotion was actually excitement because she felt like it meant she was looking forward to something and then she could be really let down. And that felt too like vulnerable or too scary for her. And so, yes, you can definitely experience that as a result of BPD. Hence why one of the main components, well, really there's two pieces to BPD treatment. If you like dialectical behavior therapy or DBT, and that is mindfulness. So we can start to acknowledge these reactions before they're really intense, as well as emotion regulation. So we know that that's happening. And then we have some tools and techniques to help us calm our system down and be okay. And that's why that's such a huge piece of the work that we'll do. And there was a final add-on that says, or actually there's two, sorry. It says, I experienced this as well and have often wondered the same over the last few years. 
I go into a much in much darker places when I'm tired, but I also tire more when I'm sad and or depressed. How does this relate to grief? My son took his life four months ago, and now I feel both sad and exhausted most of the time. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, I have some videos about losing someone to suicide. Um, if you find that helpful, you can check those out on YouTube. Um, however, I believe that it's a con a compounded grief because you've got or compounded depression with grief you already had depression and like i said before when we feel more tired we're not as resilient we also could have been distracted so then we feel the depressive symptoms more intensely but i feel like the same could apply for for your experience with grief where we had the depression and grief feels a lot like depression it's almost like you're adding like a weight to it where you're like oh and so it's making it even harder. It's more exhausting for you to do the things you probably need to do today. One of the best phrases or kind of quotes I learned in my therapeutic process when I lost my dad was that it was like life had thrown a 70 pound backpack on me and was like, okay, go about your business. Same way you used to. And you're like trudging and it's hard, right? 70 pounds. Ugh, that's like a, a carrying a, a large child around on, with you all day. And that can be really exhausting. And so I want you to take your time with this. Know that it's okay to feel exhausted. Grief is fucking heavy and exhausting. And depression can be the same. So make sure you're just speaking up with your therapist. If you're not in therapy, I'd encourage you to get into it. Um, tell them about this experience. Tell them what you're feeling. Um, especially if we already suffer from depression, it might be a time when we're grieving. Like our psychiatrist might think of increasing our medication or adding something on for a period of time to get us through. If you're already on medication, that's something you want to look into. You can talk to your doctor about that. Um, like for me, I went, I increased my sessions in therapy. So maybe if you're going once a week or once every two weeks, you increase that a little bit. Um, there's a lot of ways to kind of get you through, but it's very normal what you're experiencing. You already had depression and then you lost your son to suicide. And that's really, really sad. And it's really heavy. And grief is just, oh, I'm so sorry. And that's why you're feeling that way. It's okay to feel that way. It's also okay to get support so that it doesn't last as long. And we can, you know, feel a little bit more, not alone and like we have some tools and resources we can lean on when we need it final add-on says i've been dealing with an un with untreated depression and anxiety for some years but now it feels different it is still similar to depression but there's also a physical component i can get things done but i feel physically exhausted afterwards is it possible that i've burned out as work is really stressful and sometimes an even toxic environment it is possible you've burned out if anybody doesn't know, burnout occurs when the reward for what we do, meaning financial, um, fulfilling work, uh, feeling connected to people, right? Whatever the reward we get from our work, and it's usually more than one thing. Obviously, the financial component is like a piece of it, but there's always other stuff to it. Could even just be like getting accolades or being acknowledged for the work that we do. That can all be part of the reward. But anyway, if that reward isn't at least commensurate or greater than the effort we put in. And so if work has been really stressful and your reward has stayed the same, you could become burned out. Not to mention that depression can have a physical component as part of it. And if work has been really, really stressful and sometimes toxic, then it could have kind of triggered or exacerbated your already existing depressive symptoms. And so yes, that could definitely be what's going on here. It's incredibly common for our depressive symptoms to manifest physically. One of the most common is just body aches and exhaustion. And like I've said before, we'll end up at the doctor's office thinking like we have the flu or we've come down with a cold, but it's really depression taking its toll. Um, so that could be part of it as well. But yes, th those are all reasons that it could happen. Um, please speak up and reach out and get yourself some support. Okay? Okay. Let's move on to question number three. This question is, hi, Katie. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. It says, my question is about physical touch in therapy. If I'm not mistaken, you've mentioned that you may touch a client if they ask it as a way to calm down. But what if you don't feel like it at the moment? Would you rather be authentic to yourself or help the client? And how would you deny it without hurting their feelings? I hope this makes sense. Thanks a lot. Okay, a lot to unpack here. Number one, um, when I'm uh, when I'm like therapist Katie in my office seeing a patient, that time is theirs and it's about them. So if I didn't feel like putting my hand on their shoulder, I still would because it's not really about me. That's not my time. If I'm having an issue with it, then I need to bring that up in my own therapy so I can figure out why I'm feeling that way because I have to show up for my patients. And if I can't, then that's my issue to deal with, okay? 
So there's that piece. However, a lot of therapists don't believe in physical touch as part of therapy. I obviously don't agree, but I respect their, you know, their the differences. I respect people's different opinions. And the reason that some therapists don't feel like it's helpful is because they want their patients to learn to self-soothe on their own without the help of the therapist um, and finding ways to regulate so they can do it on their own, which I respect and I totally get. Um, so... All that to be said that I think if a patient, let's say I wasn't comfortable with touch and I, that wasn't something I was going to offer in my practice, then it'd be something I would address right away. Meaning that in the paperwork, when we fill out, like it's, it's usually when you see a new patient and you take someone on in your practice, there's something called informed consent. And that means that the patient needs to be informed upon like what their rights are, like HIPAA laws, the confidentiality stuff, um, cancellation policies, any office policies that I have, the cost and when they, you know, all sorts of things. They have to fill that out, read it, sign it, and they get a copy. That's just part of the intake process. So during that, I would discuss, because that's when I discuss boundaries with my patients too, where I'm like, know that you can text or call in between sessions. Um, It'll take me 24 hours to get back to you. This isn't a way to call if you just need extra support you know, if, if that's the case, then maybe we need to see each other more than once a week. You can text to change an appointment time, um, but know that I will not respond to emails in between, you know, all the rules, all the things, all the boundaries that I have. If it's an emergency, you can reach out, you know, otherwise I expect you to use your tools. And if it's an emergency, please call me and I'll meet you at the hospital. You know, I walk them through all that, walk them through when I'd have to report things, right? Confidentiality. Um, so there's all that stuff. And that would be the time that I would say, I want you to know that I also, you know, I don't hug clients. I don't place hands on you. So don't worry about that. It's not something I'm comfortable with, with doing. And here's why. So that would be probably the place where you would say it. You wouldn't wait until the moment and then say it because that's when things can be kind of hurtful to a patient and it could be maybe damaging to the therapeutic relationship. But let's say, okay, it's not an ideal situation. We're already seeing this person and we didn't tell them that we don't do physical touch, but we don't want to. Then if they ask for it, then that's when we could explain. We could say, I hear you and I'm so sorry, but I don't do that in this office and here's why. And we explain. Um... Obviously, someone's feelings could get hurt, but that's something that we should process through and talk out. That's the beauty of therapy is you could say as a therapist, this is when the onus is on the therapist always, right? We would say something to the effect of, you know, I don't do this in my practice. Here's why. And say, I understand this might be hard and I'm happy to keep talking this out. Or if this hurts your feelings, you let me know. I'm happy to, you know, process this through with you. It has nothing to do with you. It's just a policy across my entire office, you know things like that so that they know that they can bring it up, you can talk about it, and you can move through it. And that's really it. I mean, that's kind of how we manage it. That keeps things ethical, keeps things above board. It means that the patient understands and there's been conversations because as therapists, our goal is to show you what healthy communication and conflict conflict resolution looks like. Like what can we do differently in our relationships and how as a therapist can I demonstrate that healthily with to my patients, if that makes sense. And there's a comment on this says, hi Katie, I wanna go become a therapist in the future and I'm not sure how to go about this. Like how much physical touch can I give a client or how to respond to them? How do you learn how to go about it? Because it's just a bit scary, I think, or to think about because I don't wanna be a bad therapist. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. Now. When it comes to physical touch, I keep it to a minimum. I know some of you might be thinking, and maybe it's because I haven't been very clear, but it's not like I'm going to hug a patient every session. I wouldn't do that because you have to remember when you're with a therapist, they're assessing everything that's happening from a therapeutic perspective. So if a patient is asking me for hugs every single time, that means that they don't know how to self-soothe and they require physical touch to self-soothe and they're getting it only from me or they only know how to regulate when I assist them, right? There's so many things to this that we're going to have to figure out some inner child work. We're going to have to find some other people in their lives that can offer some physical touch. I, Like I said, I've had a few patients who've asked for this over the years. Most of the time I've said yes. Sometimes I have said no because I feel like they're relying on it. As one of my patients, I encouraged her to get a roommate. She didn't want one. She lived alone. She worked from home. She worked alone. And she just wouldn't see anybody except for me. And so our homework was to have her get out and see some, you know, we need to do things. And so that's, those are the reasons that you might like put limitations on it. But it's more something that I do 
every so often. Like, um, like one of my patients was trying to get pregnant and had a miscarriage and I offered her a hug and she gladly took it. Um, I've had patients who dissociate a lot and part of it is like me touching like their arm, like specific areas, right? Could be their knee, but for this patient it was like their arm. So there could be stuff like that. Again, that's minimal though. And it's, it's something that we would talk about together so that there's no surprises, no one's triggered, and they're also not relying on it for their only source of calming because I want you to be able to do that on your own too. So that's really what you have to consider. And those are kind of the limitations. And trust me, as you go through school and you become a therapist, you'll learn about these things. And that's why we have hours that we have to accrue before we take our licensing exams. And that's why we also, you know, have to do our CEUs every two years. I, in the state of California, we had to gather 36. I want to say in Texas, it's 30. Maybe it is 36. But either way, every two years, you have to gather some continuing education units. And that can be, you know, something that you decide to learn more about by through doing that. Um, yeah. And that's really it. You're not, don't worry about it. You've got time to figure it out. But in the end, at the end of the day, when it comes to therapy, the goal is always for the patient to feel supported, but not overly reliant. And it's tricky. And we walk this line, right? And sometimes we get a little closer to the more reliant than the, you know, but we do our best to keep it somewhere in the middle. Okay. Let's move on to question number four. This question says, hi, Katie, I've never had a boyfriend. My parents were emotionally neglectful, and I tend to look up to female role models around me, putting them on a pedestal while being afraid of men. My dad used to scream a lot and slam doors and was always angry. However, there is a problem. I'm straight, and I would like to have a relationship, but I don't know how to work on that on my own. How can I get rid of my irrational fear of men? Okay, now, arguably, it's not irrational, right? Our main man in our life, our father, was super abusive and scary. So of course we're afraid of men because that's the main man in our life. Um, the way to work through this, it, and I know you said you can't, you don't know how to work on it on your own. And the the truth is you shouldn't work on it on your own. We should get you a trauma therapist, someone who you can talk this through with. You can better understand where this is coming from. We can process it so that we don't have an emotional charge. And then, and only then, the goal would be to have some skills and resources and tools we can use to calm us down. And then we slowly engage with men, meaning maybe it's just out casually with, with a group. Maybe we go say hi to someone at the gym or maybe our favorite coffee shop. The guy who works there is cute. So we kind of smile and say hi and flirt or whatever. And there's going to be different levels as we kind of work our way up. But we can't do that until we've processed some of the trauma we've sustained and we have tools and resources we can pull on when we start to feel ourselves get overwhelmed and go into that fear slash trauma response. So it's not that you have an irrational fear. It's that you have a fear based on a trauma. And yes, that trauma is not currently happening, but that doesn't make the experience that we had any less real or our response to it any less valid, right? But we need to get some therapeutic support so we can be challenged to work through it at a pace that feels okay for us. Because yes, we can work on some things on our own, but when it comes to trauma, it's it's hard for us to push ourselves and to not go too far. It's almost like we either can't challenge ourselves or we do too much. And it's hard for us to find that middle ground because it's uncomfortable. And we've trained ourselves throughout our life to like not think about it, not deal with it, just move forward. And that's, you know, and also to come up with tools and resources that we get, it's going to be hard. It's way, way better for us to find a therapist that we connect with. We feel sees us, hears us, and they can help us work through this at a pace that feels challenging yet safe, or at least neutral, okay? And that will help you move through this fear that you have of men and move you into a place where you can hopefully cultivate a healthy relationship with a man. Now, does that mean you have to get married to that man? No, nope. I encourage you to date people and get to know people and decide what's right for you. Um, but we can get you to a place where you can do that. It just is going to take us a little time. It's going to take us a little therapeutic work, but you'll get there. Now, there was an add-on that says, I have this exact, exact problem too. The idea of being in a relationship is comforting and something that I want, but my attachment issues cause me to attach to older women and to be afraid of men, even though I'm straight. I'm not sure if this is a matter of working through the attachment issues first before trying intimate relations with men, 
inner child work could be really helpful here. Um, honestly, for both of these people who ask these questions, I have a workshop on my website, katiemorton.com. You can go to the shop. Um, there's an inner child workshop if you're needing some assistance there. That's something you can try to do on your own. There's homework, worksheets, all that stuff. Also, my Amazon shop, I have some inner child workbooks and other books that I like that I've utilized in the attachment workshop or inner child workshop, sorry. Um, but you can go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Morton. You should be able to find those things there. Um, I also have an attachment workshop, but I believe that a lot of this, it could be due to the issues that you had growing up. Because again, our parents, our relationship with our parents is like this blueprint for life. And when we grow up having someone abuse us, who's supposed to care for us, we're like, oh, that's what love is. That's what relationship is. Or that's what men are like. And then we take that out into the world. And even though it's not true, you're right. Like not every man is going to treat us like our father or whoever our abuser was, right? Not every person is going to be just like them, but we don't know any different. And so it can be really hard for us to feel safe around that type of person because it's going to remind us of the person who harmed us. And rightfully so, right? It's protective. It's part of PTSD is that we avoid things that remind us of the trauma. So you're avoiding it and that's that's okay. It makes sense. But working on healing from that trauma is going to be really key. And I believe inner child work could really be beneficial here as well. Now, attachment we could work on that too, but I feel like that's down the line. I don't think that's necessarily something we have to do right away. I'd more focus on the trauma work and um, inner child stuff as part of that. And that should help you. Okay. Now let's move on to question number five. It says, hi, Katie, is it possible that I may need to manage my mental health with coping skills for the rest of my life? It is mentally exhausting trying to stay grounded, use mindfulness skills, check the facts, opposite action, etc. So much of my day. Will it always be this way? I will be getting discharged from a partial hospitalization group treatment this week where I have been learning coping skills for the past six weeks. While they help, I can't imagine having to live day after day fighting these thoughts with skills. I'm wondering if it gets easier. Thanks for all that you do. Of course, and yes, it does. Now you're in a PHP, a partial hospitalization program, and you're getting intensive treatment. And that's because you needed more support which is why you're using your tools all the time to help you stay grounded, use mindfulness skills, check the facts, all that stuff. It's working for you to get you out of the need for that level of care. Amazing. In my experience, we're going to need to use coping skills and stuff pretty intensely for a few months when we're out of treatment. I know you're like, oh, so exhausting. But it's just for a few months. Essentially, what what using it all the time does is it creates a new habit so that it doesn't feel so exhausting trying to do these. They become like knee-jerk reactions. Now, that does not mean that we're going to have to do these all day, every day for the rest of our lives. No. But a lot of the behavioral change that we'll be doing helps us better interact and engage with our world and our life. So our experiences aren't as overwhelming. It might become like a knee-jerk reaction for us to check the facts. I know personally, I check my facts all the time. Does it feel exhausting and like a chore? No, because I kind of do it without even thinking about it. And that's kind of where you'll get with some of these most helpful coping skills. But overall, as we become less dysregulated and better able to engage with, you know, life without feeling overwhelmed, we won't need the tools as often either. We'll have them because life gets stressful and things change and we can use them then, but you won't have to do it every day, day in and day out for the rest of your life. No, that's just not how it works. But you're going to need to now just essentially because you're in kind of crisis and now we're transitioning out of our partial hospitalization program and we want to make sure that we stay feeling good. So I encourage you, just like I do all of my patients, please utilize your skills as much as possible. Even though you're out of the, I know when you're out of treatment, it gets harder to do it. Make time for it and please do it because this is going to be key for you not having to go back to that PHP program and for you to be able to stay out and do outpatient treatment on your own. Is it easy? No, but is it worth it? 100%. And like I said, it's just going to be a, a period of time here where we do it you know, day in, day out, day out, and then we won't have to anymore. So don't feel like it's going to be forever. It's just a short period of time and you got this. Okay. And I'm proud of you for going into treatment and getting more support. Okay, let's move on to question number six. This question says, hey, Katie, do you have any advice on what to do with the thoughts that humans, including me, don't deserve to exist because of all the terrible things we've done to each other and this planet? Thank you. When I read this question, I was like, this sounds like a depression question. 
and I don't even mean to laugh. It's just sometimes when we're so deep in our depression, we can have these like, what I, this is a passive suicidal thought. Like I don't deserve to exist, right? I've done so many terrible things to this place and this planet. And we're kind of spiraling out in a negative brain space. And so my advice on this is to challenge these thoughts. Um, we have to do some bridge statements. Remember, bridge statements aren't positive, they're just not negative. So it doesn't mean that, the, that we're going to say like, of course I deserve to exist. This planet's amazing. I've been, I've done so many good things. Look at me. No, that's not what I mean. A bridge statement would be something like, mm, I'm open to the possibility that I'm not quite as shit of a person as I think I am. Or maybe possibly Katie's right. Maybe, I don't know, that all the terrible things I've done don't mean that I shouldn't exist. Maybe she's right. I'm open to considering it, right? There are things like that, kind of in these just like possibles, maybes kind of space. And the reason that this is my answer is because this type of thinking is simply depressive slash negative thoughts. And it's not helpful. There's nothing we can do with it. It's like an existential crisis where you're like, oh my God, the planet, we've done so many terrible things. We shouldn't even be here. You know, how do you expect yourself to deal with that? Like, what are you going to, what are you going to do? Right? There's no actionable thing that's healthy that we can do to make that feel better. And that's why, that's when you know you're caught in a negative cycle. When you're like, wow, there's nothing healthy I can do to make this feel better. It's just a shit place to be. My brain is caught in a shit place. And what do we do when we're caught in a shit place? We use some bridge statements to help move us out. And the movements are small, but you will feel them. It'll feel so much better just to be like, maybe, maybe I'm, it's not as bad as I think it is, right? Just possibly. Um, that's really my advice for you, okay? Now, another comment said, and this comment wasn't quite related, but it's a, it's a quick answer, so we'll get through it. It says, I am 16 and I have these thoughts too, but I also don't want to be here anymore because how, of how my parents will fight and argue. This often happens when I'm in a different room and they don't even know that I can hear them. When this happens, I just want to go to my room and cry. Why? And how do I deal with this? I hope this makes sense. Yes. You want to go to your room and cry because your parents are your family and your support system. And even if they suck at their job, we still want them to get along and we don't like conflict. Humans are conflict averse just by nature because we don't want to be at odds with each other. It's better for us. Connection is really important, right? Connection soothing to our system. Conflict is often the opposite of connection. And so just hear your parents arguing causes stress and kind of um, makes our home life kind of, I don't want to say dysfunctional. That's not the word, but it's almost like it's tumultuous. It's not... Um, it's not consistent. It's not calming. It's not supportive. It's not something we can rely on. It can feel very dysregulating. And so having your parents argue, of course, is dysregulating too. It's why it's making you cry. It makes you sad. I would let them know you hear them. I would ask them what's up. Parents need to learn how to talk to their children and to say, you know, I'm not getting along or we had a fight about X, Y, or Z. It had nothing to do with you. The fact that parents try to hide it and go in a different room we all know we can hear things in other rooms. Come on now, people. Let's not be foolish. Don't think your children are stupid. They're not. They know everything. They know way more than you think they know. And the sooner we speak to our children and tell them, hey, you know, um, I'm sorry if you heard us shouting, your mom or your dad and I were, were arguing about X, Y, or Z, but don't worry, we'll figure it out. It has nothing to do with you. You are doing everything right. This is between us and us just trying to, you know, come to an understanding or an agreement or we're trying to figure this out. Talk to children that way because they know you're fighting, even if you think you're hiding it and they're going to make it about themselves and they're going to internalize that. And that's not healthy because most of the time it doesn't have anything to do with the kids. Yes, kids are a stressor, but it's usually about some other thing that we're going through, something we're trying to figure out or decide on. And one of us feels like they're winning or losing and it's hard, you know, and maybe we're getting a divorce. But if we are, we need to talk to our kids about that too and explain to them, you know, what's going on. So um, I'm sorry you're going through that, but you know, know that your response is valid. I would be crying too. It'd be sad. We need to tell our parents, hey, I hear you guys fighting. You know, what's happening? It's okay to ask. It's your family. You have to live there. And that's why, you know, it feel it makes it feel unsafe. And so we want to know what's happening. So ask them. Okay. 
Moving on to question number seven says, hey, Katie, before I ask, I'd like to thank you for everything you do for us. Of course. Says, I've been having a tough few weeks and your videos have really helped. Yay. I'm so glad I could be there for you when you needed it. Says, my question is, why do I feel like I want to be in a bad moment? Sometimes I feel like I just want to be depressed or to harm myself, but not because it's comfortable, because I simply want to. I desire to. It's really weird. It's like I want to seek attention. I've never done that, actually. I've always wondered why people did that. And now I'm all day thinking about suicide or how to harm myself, but I don't think it's necessary. Sorry if this is difficult to understand. I don't even think I understand it myself, sadly. Oh, and sadly, going to therapy is not an option. Okay, well, going to therapy is a goal for the future. That's where I really think you should be headed. However, the reason sometimes we want to feel bad, it, well, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but the number one that I always think of is it f- helps us feel like our experience or our depression is like more valid, like warranted. It can feel when we aren't actively feeling shitty or wanting to harm ourselves, we can be like, I'm just overreacting, right? We can easily minimize or invalidate what we're going through. We're like, ugh, I'm making this into something that's not. When that's not the case, it just so happens that the symptoms aren't as intense or palpable at that moment. And so we can feel that way because we want to feel like our our mental illness, our experience, our struggle is valid. So that's a piece of it, okay? So there's that. Then we can also, you know, want to be in a bad moment or want to feel um, shitty because it is comfortable. Like you said, um, oh, you said not because it's not comfortable, but for some people it can be comfortable. Almost like we're used to feeling that way and feeling good is a little bit like we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Now that's not the case for the person who asked this question, but if you're out there experiencing that, that's also incredibly common. And then the third reason that I can think of, and if something comes to mind, I'll let you know, but those were the top three for me. The third is that attention. Now we've always talked about how seeking attention is such a bad thing. Meh. It's a human need. There's a reason children act up in school. We say, oh, they're doing it for attention. Oh yeah, probably because their parents are neglectful or abusive. They're looking for someone to care for them. They don't know how to do it. And so they're trying to get attention, good or bad. They'll take what they can get. And it's the same if we grow up without addressing that and getting some support. We still need to, we still need attention. So we go out seeking it. And so you said, it's like, you want to seek attention. Maybe you need attention. There's nothing wrong with that. We talk about it like it's a bad thing, but it's a human need. We all need attention. And if we don't get it healthily, we'll try to find it in some other ways. And so I would encourage you my actual homework. And what I think will help you the most is to find some ways to get more connected. Now, when I say connected, I don't mean I mean, you could be joining a group or something like that, but I just mean reach out to the people that you love who love you back, the people you really know, that true connection. Do you have like one close friend or family member, someone you can tell them like, hey, this is really how I feel. I know for some people, they're like, I don't have that person. That's when a therapist is a great substitute. Um, But we need to get connected with someone so we can talk to them about what we're going through and they can talk to us about what they're going through and we can feel uh, understood and soothed because that's really what we're trying to get at here. And I think a nice way to reframe any of our unhealthy behavior is to recognize that it's just our urge to self-soothe. We don't know how else to soothe ourselves. And so we use the tools that we can to help calm us down, help us feel better. So give yourself like, you know, a little pat on the back, a little understanding to say, yeah, I am doing it to seek attention because I need attention because I'm a human and that's part of my human needs, right? We need to reframe this. I'm doing this because it feels soothing. It's the only way I know how to feel better. That's really all we're trying to do. As humans, we're just always trying to soothe and feel better. And if we don't have good tools to do it, we'll use what we've got, right? And so I encourage you to get that connection so that we don't feel the urge to really harm ourselves or take our own life or anything like that, okay? Okay. Final question, question number eight. says, hi, Katie. I came from a sexually dysfunctional family and was sexually abused by my brother from about five to seven. However, he did it through care and being the person that I looked to for everything. He was my go-to in the family. He was eight years older. Can this be a trauma if there was no fear? Um, oh, if no fear was there, as I didn't understand what was going on. At 16, when I understood what he did, I realized it was so wrong, but still needed and relied on him and buried what he had done. I'm 54 now, diagnosed recently with BPD, complex PTSD, and have been in therapy for five years so far. 
Thank you for all that you do. It helps so much to understand and not feel like the only one. Of course, it is nice to not feel like the only one, right? Yes, that was still trauma. And the reason, that, okay, so I know we're using the word trauma and I would encourage you to replace this as a trauma and call it abuse. And yes, abuse is traumatizing, but just hang with me because this might help you better acknowledge and agree, okay? So if our brother for about two years or more was abusing us, right? Because that's what's happening. He was sexually abusing you. And you even said I was sexually abused by my brother from this. So let's use that term abuse. When we're abused, it means that the person who should care for us, right? He was your go-to. He was the one that you went to and needed support. You needed to be taken care of. He was almost like your parent, right? He, instead of doing those things or maybe as well as doing those, those things, he took advantage and harmed you and abused you, okay? Now, when we're younger, we don't know. So we often aren't actively terrified when something is happening, which can make the word trauma a little confusing, but just hang with me, right? Now, the person who was supposed to care for you harmed us by abusing us. And even if we didn't understand what was happening enough to be scared, I guarantee you knew it wasn't right. Children will always, even younger children will say things like, it made me uncomfortable, or I, I wasn't sure, I didn't think that was right, or it's confusing, or I wished they would stop, right? Now, none of those phrases are like, I was terrified for my life or anything like that. I honestly believe that that's because we just don't know enough. We're too young. We don't know enough about the world. We're, we're still learning. We're like, I guess maybe this is what is supposed to happen, but it doesn't feel right, right? Our gut tells us it's not right. And the fact that he took advantage and abused you was a trauma because your youth was taken from you and you were taken advantage of. Does that make sense? Now, you weren't old enough to understand, but he was. And that power he had over you made it abuse and it also makes it a trauma because you weren't old enough to even understand, let alone process what was happening. You couldn't, couldn't consent to that behavior. You, you know, there's so many things there where you were taken advantage of in a very harmful way. And that's why you're, you know, diagnosed BPD, complex PTSD. I believe a lot of it comes from the abuse that you sustained from him. Now, I want to make sure I answer all of the questions. Yes, can this be trauma? Yes, um, especially because you relied on him. And you said when you were 16, you realized it was so wrong, but you still had to go back to him because he was the only person that could take care of you and you weren't old enough to take care of yourself yet, right? And that is always that complicated component to abuse like this because we think, why did I go back? Like, uh, I knew it was wrong. We don't have a lot of options. And as we get older, like you said, you're 54, we often forget how few options we had as a kid. And so I just encourage you to talk to a therapist and I especially since you've been diagnosed, I'd assume that, yeah, you've been in therapy for five years. I was like, I'd assume you've been in therapy for a while. And inner child work might be a movement we want to take. Like we might want to go in that direction. Let your therapist know you think that might be beneficial because I have a feeling a lot of the healing for you is going to come along with listening to younger you and actually acknowledging how she felt and thought at that time because we might not have even been able to be connected. We could have been dissociating so confused, thinking that that's what like families do, that that's love, it feels weird, I don't like it, right? There's so much confusion and uncertainty that we could have experienced and we need to hear her out. We need to be able to to make sure that, that she feels like we get her, you know, that whatever that we were experiencing as a child is heard and understood and then acknowledged and supported by adult us. And I think that work can be really healing for you, okay? Hang in there. Now, there were a couple comments on this. It says, I was abused by my dad and I am sure he never meant to hurt me. That messes up my head and my sanity. The nightmares and flashbacks are so intense sometimes and so debilitating. But I know he never meant to hurt me. He was unloved as a child and my mom was sexually, un sexually unavailable most of the time. He slept in my bedroom. He probably felt lonely and unloved. I feel sorry for him, but the consequences of his actions still affect me deeply. I feel so guilty for even remembering it all happened at night, no witnesses. How could I navigate this without losing my sanity? Sometimes in trauma, there's these 
two experiences that feel like they can't coexist, but they can. And that is feeling bad for our abuser because they're human and we can see all the reasons why it maybe happened and the fact they did a shitty thing. Your dad did a really shitty thing. Now, he could have all these reasons why he did a shitty thing. I've had tons of patients who've been abused by a parent who was also abused by their parent, right? The cycle of abuse continues, this transgenerational trauma. We pass it right along. That can happen. It happens a lot. Now, he's not responsible for the things that happened to him, right? Um, If his parents abused him, if his wife was unavailable sexually, if he had his own issues, whatever, he's not responsible for what they did. But you know what he is responsible for? His actions, each and every one of them. I don't care how lonely you are. I don't care how sad you are. I don't care how unloved you feel by your spouse or your parents or whatever. We're all responsible for the steps we take after the fact. What happened to us happened to us. It's not our fault. We, we didn't, you know, you didn't cause this. There's nothing you did to cause this abuse. But your dad was the adult and he should have taken care of you and loved you. And instead he abused you and took advantage. Now, what happened to him is shitty, and that's not his fault, but what he did is his fault. And that's that like, ooh, it's hard for our brain sometimes because of our trauma bond. What sounds like is happening here is your trauma bond because he's your father, right? You're supposed to love them. They're supposed to care for you. It can be really like a mind fuck. That's why you're feeling like you're losing your sanity. But these two things can coexist. We can love our dad and feel bad for him and also be traumatized by their actions. And just because someone doesn't mean for something to be hurtful doesn't mean that it can be hurtful either. Someone doesn't have to want to harm us for us to be harmed, right? It's like, um, this is a silly example, but just hang with me. It's like the other night, um, my sister-in-law is visiting and Sean and her were outside and we have construction and he didn't realize he hit a board and it slid into her leg and scratched her. And it's not terrible, but it scratched her. Now, he didn't mean to hurt her. But does that mean that she wasn't scratched? Of course not. She was scratched. She was harmed by his actions, even though his actions had had no premeditation, no intent to harm. But it still happened. It's no different. I know sometimes we try to make, we try to reason with it. We try to make sense of it. That urge is part of our shame and validation, minimization that kind of comes along with trauma. And so navigating this, I encourage you to be able to, as much as possible, hold both those things. They can both be true. But every time you want to say, you know, but he was lonely, I want you to hear me in your head say, but he is responsible for his actions and his actions were hurtful. We all have shit things happen, but that doesn't mean that then everybody else has to deal with me as I just run amok and abuse people. No, I'm responsible. Your dad was responsible. He was also your father. He was in a a power position, in a caretaker role. And he decided instead of taking care of you, it would harm you. And that's not okay. Um, I have a video about uh, trauma bonds if you want to uh, watch it. That could be really helpful. There might be some inner child work that you have to do um, because you're seeing it a lot from an adult view where you're like, he was, you know, unloved as a child. You're trying, you like, see this whole picture. So it might be helpful for you to get in touch with younger you a little bit and hear about what, you know, what she felt at that time. Um, Because I think we've kind of not heard her for a while. Okay. Final add-on says, how do you deal with finding out about sex through trauma as a child? And does this affect your sexual relationships as an adult? It definitely can. I found out about sex as a child when I was reading a news article and a blog about my papa being a well-known child abuser in my town after he had passed away. I spent a lot of time alone, and it could be possible he did something. My uncle also preyed on me as a teenager, but I never noticed and had a few other instances as a teenager with older men being sexual with me. Now, finding out about sex through trauma as a child can definitely affect your sexual relationships as an adult because, again, it's like this blueprint that we get. And when we're growing up, children are more curious. They're not like sexual beings in the way that adults are, We like hormonally and developmentally. We're not out there looking to have sex. We're more curiosity-based. We're getting to know our world. We're getting to know our bodies. We're curious about other people's bodies. That's all normal behavior. But when we're sexually abused as a child, we can think, we can have certain beliefs develop as a result, meaning we can think that like the only thing we're good for is sex. We can think that um, sex is always about control or pain. We can feel like sex is 
like out of control and it's always harmful and we don't get to say no. We have no say in it. We can think that sex is dirty, is bad. It makes us bad. I don't know. We can have any number of beliefs about it because of that. It can feel unsafe. Um, and we can even be hypersexualized as a result. There's a bunch of different ways that we can deal with abuse like that. And that's why it can affect our sexual relationships going forward because these old beliefs based on the abuse that we sustain follow us into adulthood if we don't process through them and understand them and choose to act differently, which is hard but possible. If we don't do that, then we'll keep acting out of those old narratives in our current life. And that can mean that we don't want people to touch us or if they do, we dissociate or maybe we have to be in control. Maybe we're hypersexualized. Maybe we... um you know, struggle to orgasm or to enjoy sex because it feels like punishment or I don't know. There can be all sorts of different things that we feel and believe. And so it can totally affect our relationships. And that's part of the reason why most of my clients end up coming in wanting to deal with it is because they find themselves struggling in their current relationships or struggling to get into any relationship, right? Because that sexual intimacy can feel very scary, very traumatizing, very overwhelming, uh, very unknown, right? And so it can definitely affect it. And that's why I would encourage you to, you know, to find a trauma specialist, to start talking about it, start processing it through. Um, I think that the Courage to Heal workbook could be helpful for you. It, it focuses mainly on childhood sexual abuse. If you find it doesn't, you're like, oh, I can't relate to this. Then there are probably other books. Unfortunately, they don't have a ton of books about that like for adults, but my book Traumatized, even though it's not specific to sexual abuse, does talk a lot about abuse and trauma as a whole. And that could be a resource and it's available at a lot of libraries. It's also um, available as an audiobook. Um, that could be helpful too. But those are just some of the ways that I would encourage you to kind of get some more support, find ways to process it through so that it doesn't have to affect your future sexual relationships. Okay. Thank you all so much for sending in your questions. Thank you for your support. Thanks for sharing this podcast. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Do your homework and I'll see you next time. Bye.